good to be alive in this land of ours. Good to drive in this land of ours. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hockey Time Machine. I'm Glenn Dreyfus. Here's one for you. A game being stopped, so a player who scored his 100th goal of a season can get a cake delivery. Here's another one. A minute-long standing ovation for a goalie who has been mercilessly heckled by those same fans. Just two of the wonderful stories on today's show. Coming up, Jerry Hack, author of Hockey Nobody, the inspiration for this episode we've more inclusively titled Hockey Somebodies. First, a real hockey somebody, Patty Adair, who once centered a line with two future NHL Hall of Famers and went on to an exceptional career in European hockey. Patty Adair has led a remarkable hockey life, which most of you know nothing about because a large part of it took place in Europe. But we're going to change that now. Hi, Patty. Hi, Glenn. How are you today? Good. Now, what is the fashionably dressed Patty Adair wearing today? Well, when I played old-timers hockey after I stopped playing when I was 32 and I started old-timers when I was 42. So, uh, when, where I played, we always play in opposite colors, dark or light. So, I went with the darks in this Leaside arena we used to play in. And uh, that's why I uh, got this sweater on. Okay, that's a Kitchener Rangers, right? Yeah, and, and later on, I, I played on the Kitchener Rangers alumni team in Austria, in Salem Z, in a tournament in, when I was 78 years old. And we're playing in the 60 division. Wait a second. I was told you're in your 40s. Well, they're, they're, don't forget, I played from 42, age 42, until 70, no, wait a minute, 83 as an old timer. And what's around your neck? This is a medal we won in in uh, in uh, that tournament in uh, in Salem Z, Austria. That that wasn't very far from two of the places I played in Austria, but this was another place that my buddy Gary Millman he played there as a goalie, and he played in Kitsborough as a goalie with me too. But he he organized the Kitchener Ranger alumni team to go there, and he does it every year. All right, let's go back in time. By the time you were 15 or 16, Patty, I understand both the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens came calling. That's right. And not only that, it's quick reason from Kingston, Ontario. He was a referee, but he was also a scout for the Canadians. Came to our hometown and he said, look, it, I want you to play in Kingston, an exhibition game of my juvenile team. I don't know how old I was, 14 or something. but I, And he said, you, I'm going to let you play with one of the I wished I could have kept those Montreal Canadian pants he gave me. But anyway, he tried to entice me, but I don't and played. And then uh, somehow Bob Wilson, a scout for Chicago Blackhawks, kept looking at me in what we call Eastern Ontario midget uh, playoffs. Anyway, I see my name in the paper in the fall, Stan Makita, and I think it was Daryl Sly. No, it wasn't Daryl Sly. It was, it was uh, Whitey Stapleton, Pat Stapleton. We were the draft picks for that midget year. And that's how I got to St. Catharines in the fall of 56. Yes. Now, why did you decide not to join either the Toronto or the Montreal organization? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think that uh, when they draft you in, back in those days, if you were a draft by Chicago Blackhawks, you had to kind of go to that place and, and show up. You know what I mean? And when I went there, I, I, I talk about it, how 
the first week I was there, I mean, you know, there's a story about Salming saying that uh, when he came to Canada, it's quite a, when you go to training camp, it's a, it's a real brawl. Anyway, first week I was, there's uh, 50 players come in and I make that team or, you know, they got me down to the finals for the junior A team. Then I have another week with 70 guys coming in. Well, after that, I'm still there. So I'm saying, geez, this is all right. I think I made the team. But then uh, we'll talk about it later. But uh, Rudy Pillis took over and uh, really helped me. I was telling that uh, we were practicing one night. And uh, I always remember uh, Pillis telling me that you got to pass. If you're passing to the right, I'm a left shot. I pass to the right. And say, let's say I'm passing over to Makita. Then I go down and, and we do breakouts. And so I'm going down and I turn my body and pass with my left hand over to Hull. And he said, don't do that. You've got to pass and learn how to pass with the backhand side. So I always remembered Rudy telling me that and I used it for the rest of my life. And I think I did pretty good passing both ways. Over to Hull. Wait a second. That might be a player I recognize. Who did you center on your line with the St. Catharines teepees? Well, the, the, the hall you're mentioning, it wasn't Dennis. He's a little younger than us, but it was Bobby. He was 17, and Stan and I were first-year draft protection. So Rudy did every favor he could to get me set up to play Junior A, but uh, it just didn't work out. And the Stan you mentioned, have we heard of him? Well, uh, you used to call him Stan the Man, but... Uh, Stan, is that Stan Makita? And now, Stan Makita. Yeah, I think that's the only time he ever did not play center. As Rudy said, uh, Bobby Hull can't pass the puck there, so you play center, and <laughs> and Bobby go uh, Bobby goes over to the wing. That's at 16 and 17 years old, though. Don't forget, he learned how to pass later. So, Stan Makita and Bobby Hull got to play with you. Well, and it, I played a lot of old timers hockey, and it got to be the story in the dressing room. That's what everybody used to kid me about. <laughs> you didn't play with them; they played with you. <laughs> uh, since you mentioned Rudy Pilius, Paul Patsku has an amazing ability to pull out video that people haven't seen in decades. And let's take a look at something he found about St. Catharines and Rudy Pilius, and then we'll talk about it. This Sorry. was the last workout for Rudy Pilius, the St. Catharines Junior A coach. On Christmas morning, he'd had a phone call. It was from Jim Norris, owner of the Chicago Blackhawks. Tommy Ivan was finding it too tough to be both general manager and coach of the Blackhawks. Would Rudy consider taking over his coach? Rudy's 43. In addition to 11 years in St. Catharines, he's coached in San Diego, Louisville, and Houston, Texas. He'd be delighted, he told Norris, to add Chicago to that list. And luckily, he had on hand coaching the St. Catharines Junior B team a new coach for the TV, Glenn Sonmore, former pro. Phyllis has an excellent coaching record. He's never yet missed the playoffs. In 1954, the St. Catharines Teepees won the Memorial Cup. He thinks that six players with the present Teepees will meet the NHL within two years, so that he doesn't see this as a real goodbye at all. Four TP graduates, Bobby Hull, Elmer Vasco, Pierre Pellot, and Ian Cushman are Hawks regulars now. He expects he'll see more of these youngsters in Chicago uniforms before long. As a player, Phillips never made the NHL himself, but he played hockey in many parts of Canada, including his native Winnipeg. He also played two years in England and a stretch with the New York Rovers. That was That's got to bring back memories. Oh, yeah. And you just brought up the name Vasco. That's where I was billeted my first year with Mrs. Vasco. She had three of us, Chico Mackey and uh, Reno Robazzo. And the three of us were as, uh, you know, the three teepees in her place. So, and when Elmer come home from Chicago one weekend, he sold me my first suit for $15. <laughs> and I loved it. Because when you had to go to Maple Leaf Gardens to play a double hitter, you had to wear a suit. Now, when you left the TPs, where did you go next? Well, I went back to my hometown and uh, replayed in the minors down there. Uh, actually, they hadn't again in the Globe Mail. I think Glenn missed this one. Adair goes from Junior A, Junior B, Junior C to Junior D. So I think I wound up going back playing on a Junior D team. 
I, I think you just described my report card. <laughs> well, you didn't uh, have any Fs. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, another of the people who took notice of you early on in your career was the legendary Father Bauer at St. Mike's. Tell me the kindness he did for you and what you remember about Father Bauer. Well, like I say, I've just got done thanking Rudy for his help. Now, Father Bauer, uh, he had me come to St. Mike's on a scholarship. And uh, actually, Bob Davis and their Leaf Scout come down to Gananoque and told me all about St. Mike's. And so I came up in September, started school. And actually, I think I should have got a football scholarship instead of a hockey scholarship. But anyway, when it came time to play hockey, I was a draft pick. And Father Bauer was in the position where... I was not doing well in school. I just got to bring this up that uh, when I went to read or uh, even do a public speaking thing, I, my whole persona just left me and I didn't feel good. So I wound back up, Father Bauer helping me go to his hometown and play for the Waterloo Siskins. So that's why I didn't stay at St. Mike's. I left school and uh, went and played junior B down in Kitchener. I don't know if you remember this, but while you were at St. Mike's, there was an accident. You got clipped in the eye by a hockey uh, goalie stick. That's Do you right. Remember I don't know that what, and who the goalie was. Yeah, I don't know who, what he, why he was doing, why he was playing with a goalie stick outside the the. Uh, he wasn't in the net that night. He was just stick handling around. Of course, he's been known to play forward too. It was Jerry Cheevers. He was a roommate actually at Tweedsmere. Jerry Cheevers clipped you with a hockey stick. I hope it wasn't too serious. Well, it left a little, uh, you know, you have a little dark spots in your eye for the rest of your life, but that that had nothing to do with anything. It was just the idea that uh, it happened and, you know, crap happens. Yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> and did you ask your roomie what the heck he was thinking? Well, we used to say prayers 7.30 every night, and I don't think uh, with Father Kelly leading the prayers that <laughs> I had time to talk about those things. <laughs> now, you mentioned Waterloo, and you didn't meet your Waterloo. You, you did great in Waterloo with the Siskins, 115 gotta... points in 30 games. That's ridiculous. Yes. Well, Father Bauer left me with, a, I think he'd set a few novenas for me when I left on, <laughs> went down by bus to Waterloo, went in on a cold January day. And uh, as soon as I took to the ice, I just seemed to get lucky. And that puck went in the net for me. I know, but you didn't get lucky 115 times. <laughs> well, that you're, t <laughs> yeah, well, I won the scoring that year. That is true. And in 30 games, I mean, you were scoring like four points a game. Well, there was a red Oled on that line and Jimmy Dahmer and the three of us finished in the top three scoring. And so we were a pretty good line. Yeah, I would say so. So Chicago, somewhere along the line, trades your rights to the Boston Bruins junior team, the Kingston Frontenacs. Tell me about that and a, maybe a story about Ren Blair, the general manager of the Frontenacs. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Glenn. Uh, see, I'm from Gananoque, which is 18 miles out of Kingston. So I don't know if he didn't think that uh, I would raise their attendance, but he gave me one chance to uh, actually give me a five-game pro trial. The Bruins somehow wrangled me away from Chicago. And in my first game down in Montreal Forum, they picked me up on the way down because we're on the east part of eastern towards uh, Montreal. The team bus pulls in and I jump on and we go down. And that night they put me, Bobby Ashley didn't come to play center. I played center between Buddy Boone and Riel Shevrefez. So I thought that was fair and I did okay, but I didn't get any points. But anyway, you get back on the bus and we're going back to Kingston. And these two guys are sitting there with a 2-4. I don't know why you, you guys in the States know what 2-4s are. But anyway, I look at them and I said, gee, I played with those guys. I should be a good buddy and help those guys with the 2-4. Of 
So we get back to Kingston, and uh, Blair says, well, come on up to morning skate tomorrow morning, and you can, and we'll see if we get you in the second game. So I come up, and I, Eddie Babick is out there. Uh, he wants to stay over, and he, he let me some, take some shots on him, and I must have shot a half an hour. So anyway, Blair tells me after the shoot, you know, after this thing, he says, well, Addersley's come back, and we won't be able to use you tonight and all this song and dance. So I said, fine. He said, but will you play with the Clinton Comets, and we'll give you 250 a week? And I said, no, I'm not going down to the Eastern League. So I, I just left it, and that was it. But uh, I don't think Ren did me any favors. Now, the two fours, we have to explain, that's 24 beers, right? Well, with three guys, that's only eight each, eh? <laughs> And not only that, Eddie Babiak, I phoned him just the last, well, I did a Facebook with him. And he said, you know, he said, I think that's why Blur didn't uh, get you to come because you were too much of an influence on those two guys you were drinking with. Yeah, that's what it was. You were a bad influence on them, uh-huh. Well, I'm going to credit Eddie Babiak for helping me through that scenario. <laughs> <laughs> now, wasn't it also in Kingston where you came upon a situation where you had no skates? Yeah, well, that's the same time. We had a uh, guy in our arena. You know how you have some of these guys that help you out. Well, they had me. I was a, kind of a chief custodian on the public skating and that. And I would do the office, uh, you know, book uh, teams to come in and play. I was, you know, like not a rink manager, but part of it. Anyway, this guy, I can even say his name, Charlie Morgan, uh, put my skates in a locker in the office and I couldn't find them and I we couldn't find Charlie and, and now here Blair's coming out with a team from Kingston and I can't find my skates but luckily enough I got the skates out of the box and roared out because it's you yeah, I had to go out to the 401 at the Gananoque bypass and get to get on that bus so it used to be a joke that no wonder Adair didn't make the uh, EPHL or whatever he forgot his skates <laughs> Now, there were different variations of this story in the years after. In some of the stories, your skates were stolen. In some of them, you just forgot your skates. Actually, neither one of those was exactly the truth. Well, I'm blaming it on the young lad I just told you. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> now, later on, you go to the training camp of the Buffalo Bison, then AHL team, but your hockey life is changed because you meet up with a European scout. Yeah, his name was Bob Beter, and uh, just in that last year, I didn't uh, didn't think I needed, not needed, but I didn't play my last year of qualification to play junior. I was still 19. And then Kitchener Waterloo Dutchman also had me on a draft list, and Stan Makita and Cliff Pennington and was 13 other guys drafted across Canada to try out for the Dutchmen who were going to play in Squaw Valley at the USA, you know, the Olympic games in 1960. Mm -hmm. So somehow uh, Veter, the guy named said, well, you know, your chances of probably making that team is not as good as if you went to Europe. So I said, yeah, you might be right. So on, I jump on a, a Rhine dam bus or not a bus, but a ship out of Montreal. And 10 days later, I'm in water Rotterdam at 19 and I'm with three other guys I played with on the Siskins the year before. And we go into the Hague, never knew what the Hague was and uh, got on that team. And believe it or not, I'm the player coach. <laughs> yeah. And so, you're 19 years old, 19 years old. So anyway, I told him that I won't be able to play only until the first game of the playoffs back home in the junior B league. I'm going back and, and I'm I signed a player's card. And I go back, and uh, the, t the uh, team, the Burlington Industrial, Pat Quinn was on that team, were going to play us, and they were contesting that I didn't play a league game, so I can't, shouldn't be, be able to play in the playoffs. But uh, there's where Bill Hanley will come in. He'll come in again. But anyway, he ruled and said I could play, and the long story is Burlington, who won or should have won the thing, couldn't beat our seventh-place team, the Siskins, and we go on and win the whole Ontario. So you went over to Holland, played there, then came back to rejoin Waterloo. That's right. Now, what were you thinking going over to Holland in the first place 
as a 19 year old that's kind of a gutsy move well it is but there was three siskins uh that were going with me our goalie and a couple other guys were good players and i thought well what's my point to, to win not to win this i don't know if i would win the scoring again but what was my point so i thought well instead of just staying here and playing in the league i'll go to uh, holland and see what it's like you know, it's probably a good thing good move i made because it, it it gave me a lifetime of uh you know I, i'm pretty proud of what i did over there now when you were having that 115 point season you must have been thinking nhl here i come was it a hard decision to kind of give up that part of your hockey future well it wasn't it wasn't i mean i wasn't a, a sure thing like stan and uh, bobby turned out to be but back then on a six-team league league it was you know like you you had to really be a superstar actually and i wasn't a superstar in junior a i was okay in junior b and then i had this malingling thing that was in my uh background but that'll come out later we will get to that but in Holland, they they called you eventually the uh, Rocket Richard of European hockey in 1962. In 35 games, you score 100 goals, and with your 100th, I understand there was a presentation on the ice. Well, I don't know if you can see behind me, uh, Glenn. There's a picture, and you can see something white in it. Yes. That's a cake. And the lady who was a fan of ours, and she taught at University of Delft. She was a professor down there. She used to come to all our games, which is maybe 50 kilometers from The Hague. She saw, I think, in the paper that I had 99 goals, and we were playing the uh, Canadian uh, Air Force team, their, their strong team. They had four teams, and the Swybrooken team was their ace team. Anybody that went to hockey or Europe to play and was a hockey player, he got assigned to Swybrooken. Anyway, they come in, and it's a big deal for Canadians to come into uh, Holland because, you know, back in what, 15 years before that, they liberated, the Canadians liberated Holland. And that's why any Canadian that played hockey in Holland was treated like a superstar. I mean, it was unbelievable. So anyway, in the second period, it's 2-2, two -two or no, it's 2-1, and I get a goal. I think we go ahead 3-1, and they stop the game in the second period and they make a presentation of this lady coming down and, and uh, the rink is sold out, you know, because it's a Canadian team playing us and we're usually uh, a strong team over there. And uh, she presented the cake and then I skate around the rink and make a big ceremony out of it. And uh, it was one of the highlights of my European uh, hockey career. Did you know that was going to happen? I had no idea. And I don't know even know if, well, they must have knew him because, you know, they had the ready the announcer to come down at Santa Rice and then, you know, all our team management jumped around and, you know, you can, you know, like I've got pictures that'll show you, I'm skating around the ice with holding my hand up with the cake and everybody's cheering. And so they made a, you know, like <laughs> I use the word rock star. They treat me pretty good. <laughs> now, I don't know if it was the same season, but in one game, one game, you scored <laughs> 10 goals. And not only thinking, that, there was something else unusual about that game. That's right. And I was thinking about that. And that's not even the year I got the 100 goals. It was the next year. And we were playing in Hanover, Germany, playing for some cup. And we win, I think, 14-4 or whatever it was. But uh, what you're talking about, that other thing was that uh, back uh, when uh, you, you took your goalie, you could take your goalie out on a penalty shot. The Germans, I didn't know how how far they were, but the German goalie was taken out and their best defenseman went in. And I get the puck at the red line and out he comes. And I didn't know, you know, I had my head down or something. I didn't realize it was a forward, but he stopped me. He, he threw a stick and you know how they can, for, you know, you throw that stick and but I was off guard. But anyway, I missed the penalty shot. Okay, but there's another fact to this game what i read was you were one of only nine players in that game on your team and you almost never left the ice well that's why i was playing coach yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Wait. Back home, back home, you could sit on the pine, and I, I hated sitting on the pine. So Coach Adair never complained that player Adair, his shifts were too long? Listen, we had a little complaints form, and it was just a little piece of paper, and if you wanted to fill out the complaint, <laughs> you gave it to me. <laughs> What was it like playing in the Netherlands? How popular was hockey? Did it resemble the game you played back in Canada? Oh, yeah. I got to tell you, one night, the uh, a, a, a defenseman of ours, Will Van Domelen, he was really good. I think he could play junior A here in Canada. His father owned all the big uh, theaters in, in Rotterdam and in The Hague. And the day that El Cid was shown as a grand opening of that movie, I think it was in that year, they had the king and queen sit in that uh, movie theater that, that uh, you know, for the grand opening. And the next night, we sat in those identical seats the king and queen sat in. So I don't know where hockey players fit, but us Canadians did okay. <laughs> That's great. Now, you didn't just stay in the Netherlands. I understand at the age of 21, you also barnstormed through Europe playing exhibition games. What was that like at the age of 21? They would pay me to come down, and I can remember going to, to Bel uh, Liege, Liege it was. And I don't think they had too many games that year, but they used to ask for other teams to strengthen them, so they'd get me to come down. And no bragging, but one game, and the, the ice is not very long. I mean, it's shorter than our ice surface. Here I'm a little bit bragging, but in the first period, I get six goals. And I said to the coach, I said, I don't think you need me for the rest of the day. Well, that was nice of you. <laughs> well, they had me back a few times, so I liked it. <laughs> was there a language barrier? No, those Dutch guys, at, it, Glenn, you could sit down with, we, we sat down with a lot of, you know, in, when we were in the Armed Force Base camps, like the Germ or the Army camps in Germany and the Air Force camps, we'd go in there and they didn't even know that some of our players weren't the Canadians. Our Dutch guys could speak French, English, German, and uh, whatever their language, and do it all in one sitting. And it was unbelievable. And all I could say was, dunk you well in Holland. That's Dutch. That means thank you. That's the only <laughs> words I knew. Well, I'm beer. I'm beer. <laughs> Later, you played a couple of years in Austria and then a couple more in Italy. And it reminds me, these days, when we talk about non-traditional hockey markets, we're talking about Nashville or Phoenix. What was it like playing in really non-traditional hockey markets? Well, actually, uh, they, that team we used to play. We used to play a, like a Christmas series. We'd go leave the Hague, play fifteen games in fifteen uh, games in about four different countries. We'd start off in Germany and then go to Switzerland, and we'd go down to Austria, and we'd even go into Italy, and then we'd come back after a fifteen uh, road trip. That's where play, mainly we play most of our games. But, uh, you know, like, you know, when I grew up in high school, we were taking history, and here I am living history, going through all these countries. Was it an adjustment coming back to play in Canada and on the Canadian-sized ice surfaces? Well, I think it was. I'll just go back to that nine-player uh, uh, team we had in, the, in Galt. And then, I, actually, I wasn't on the Allen Cup team that won. I got called back with Mike Corbett and Dunk McDonald the next year to uh, go over back again to Germany and play East and West Germany at that time. There was no, there was Iron Curtain was still up. And so uh, I was, we were at it, the three of us were added on to help them over there. And I think we did. From what I read, you were impressed by East Germany, but not in a good way. It was kind of grim. Oh, my God, it was like gray. Everything was gray. And you could see the difference when you come over to West Germany, all the mahogany wood bars and all that stuff. But over in East Germany and Wieswasser and all those cities we played in over there, it was day and night. Unbelievable. Even though you're having all these wondrous adventures on the continent, 
somewhere along the line, you started to not feel right. And if you would, I'd appreciate if you would go into that part of your journey. Okay, well, then I'll just start. After leaving uh, Klagenfurt, which was the Austrian national team, uh, we qualified for the European Cup final against the Prague team. But it never turned because the World Championships come up, so we never played. But anyway, I wind up getting my biggest contract from Milan, Italy in 1967, I guess. And this guy owned all the standard stores, like, uh, you know, big department stores in Italy, and he paid the bill. And he had me come down, and I did okay, but Cortina del Pazzo was their national team, most of the guys. But I played against them a lot in uh, Cortina and all that. As a matter of fact, the Olympics are going to be there uh, what, in 26. So anyway, the first year I do very well. I'm really uh, doing my number. And then the next year I go back, and I have Helka, my wife, and my son Tom with us, or with me. And I go in there, and in November, I'm not feeling well, and I know what it is. It's, it's, it's this uh, stupor I get into, and I said to Helka, I went through this in Holland in 19, uh, er, yeah, 1964, and I'm not going again. Played out my month, earned my money, and then left uh, Italy, and that was it for my European career. I came back to Canada, got a job at the Bank of Nova Scotia, and then a year later, I, then I joined the Gold Hornets. And your journey to mental health was something that was an ongoing process for you, and I appreciate that you're willing to talk about that. Yeah, I am. And I really have a level of guilt, uh, Glenn, that when I left uh, Holland back in 64, I left before the season was over because right from the time I got there until I left, there's no psychiatrist over there. There's nobody I can talk to. And so I said, gee, I got to get home. So I flew home and saw my family doctor. And within minutes, he had me up in the Kingston General Hospital with Dr. Hoken. And it was a Friday and I was just... Uh, really beside myself. And so they kept me over the weekend. And then uh, for about four months after that, I went on, I think he put me on lithium to help me get out of wherever I was. And it wasn't great. Well, I think they found out that lithium as a cure has more problems than it solves. But what was your journey to, as I've heard you say, coming out the other end? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I look back over my uh, my life and, uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of, of, of my accomplishments and uh, some of those spots. But after I got, uh, I think I want to tell you the biggest fall I ever had, and I got to go back to the psychiatrist and the health system we have here in Canada. I went to Dr. Eddie Kingston, our top uh, psychiatrist at St. Michael's Hospital. And I can tell you, I just lost my job with the uh, insurance company I was working for after 27 years. And I had, th this is the biggest fall I ever had. It was so bad that my first appointment with Dr. Kingston was supposed to be at nine o'clock. Anyway, his secretary calls me and says, he can't see until 10. Well, I just about died. I, I couldn't believe that I had to wait another hour, but I did. And, and then over the longest period of time, I got to tell you, Glenn, it's like falling in a deep black hole. And I've heard that psychiatrists are telling me that you, you crawl up one or let's say, yeah, one or two steps every day, and then you fall back one. But you don't know how deep you're in here. 
So anyway, uh, without Dr. Kingston's expert help and my biggest uh, setback in my life, he got me through it. And then I'd saved now for 30 years, I'm 84 today. I was 54 then. I, I really kind of did all right. I mean, uh, I've had some dips, but nothing like that one. I think it's very courageous for folks like you to talk about this openly because it helps to reduce the stigma that should never have been there in the first place. We don't think ill of somebody who is rehabbing a broken arm. We shouldn't place any type of look askance at somebody who's working on making their brain right. So I really do appreciate you being willing to discuss that part of your journey. Well, when you and Paul and uh, Kevin Foster I've met uh, have really been an inspiration to me to come out. And with Bell, Telephone, Let's Talk, I've watched that program for 14 years now. Uh, and then that Martin Benson doing his speech, and he tells me a lot of soccer players are coming out, even admitting that they should have come out. Let's hope the hockey players that have had some similar things that I've had uh, don't take it too personally because it's not your fault. And all I'm going to say, and I'm going to end, uh, Glenn, I hope you're okay with this. Uh, the medication got me better, and a, a doctor told me, what gets you better keeps you better. So stay on the meds or whatever you can do, and I think everything will work out. Patty Adair, well, I never got to interview uh, Rocket Richard, but I now I can say I've interviewed the Rocket Richard of European hockey. Pat Adair, thank you so much for sharing your stories and your time. It's really been a pleasure. All my pleasure, Glenn, and good luck to you. We titled this show Hockey Somebodies as a riff on the title of Jerry Hack's Odyssey in the Sport, memoir of a hockey nobody. Well, we don't believe there's any such thing as a hockey nobody, but Jerry, thank you for making time for us. Glenn, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. When you were a kid playing road hockey, what was your first goalie equipment like? <laughs> uh, it was a, a couch cushion, uh, the, you know, the foam insert to a couch cushion cut in half. And uh, those were the leg pads. And uh, we used elastic straps to strap them to our legs. Uh, the chest and arm protectors was just a winter jacket underneath our jersey. And uh, we didn't wear masks, uh, not for not until I got into my teens. And then uh, a hockey glove, a regular player's hockey glove for the blocker and a baseball glove for the catcher. Did this provide adequate protection for you? Well, we only used a tennis ball, so... <laughs> It, it worked. I mean, you could, you know, the, the pain quotient was quite high if you got hit in the right spot, but, uh, but for, for the most part, it, it, it was adequate. Beer league hockey is filled with guys you write about who, as you say in the book, quote, weren't just the star of the team. They thought they were the whole effing galaxy. And one of those was a fellow goalie named Red Light Ronnie. <laughs> yeah, Red Light Lonnie was uh, my first goaltending partner. Uh, I started playing ice hockey when I was 18. I was a year out of high school, and I didn't even know how to skate. So just through a twist of fate, I got uh, a tryout with a beer league team. And so he was the other goalie, and it was summertime, so they were playing once a week during the summer. And, uh, my friend who got me the tryout, he was complaining about red light Lonnie quite a bit. And so I asked if I bought a pair of skates, could I get a tryout? And he said, sure. They're always looking for goalies. So, so I did. And, uh, yeah, red light, <laughs> red light Lonnie was probably the worst goalie I, I ever, <laughs> I ever saw. <laughs> he just, yeah. And he thought he was, you know, he was one of those guys who just had a, uh, 
an inflated view of his own ability and he, he thought he was he thought he was something great but uh, he thought he was the next coming of jock plant but but yeah so a, after that that summer they decided to gas red light lonnie and keep me and another guy who also played goal you ran into that a few times in your hockey career players who maybe had a higher opinion of themselves than was deserved <laughs> yes well after about uh six years or eight years of uh beer league hockey i i i read an ad in the paper uh a senior team in saskatchewan was looking for a goalie and some players and it said salary negotiable so you know I'm, my dream had always been to get paid to play hockey my friend who got me the tryout with the beer league team him and i always talked about wouldn't that be awesome to get paid to play hockey so um so i I wangled my way for a, a tryout and my first practice there was a guy and they were calling him history and I thought oh man this guy must be really good if they're calling him history and 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 so I get out to the practice and history is the worst player <laughs> he's like, he's like not not even close to any any of the other like all the other guys had played some form of junior hockey and and triple a midget and stuff so you know, uh, this history guy just was, was terrible. And so after practice was over, I went and the, the coach brought me in and told me, you know, what the deal was. They, they gave me the one practice and they were going to give me the one game. And if I played well in that one game, they were going to sign me for the rest of the year. And so after we had that talk, I said, well, what's with this history guy? If they're in nickname history, I thought he'd be pretty good. And, and the coach said, well, as soon as we get enough players, he's history. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, take me back to getting your fitting for your first real goalie mask. What is that oh. process? <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> up to then, I'd been using this fiberglass Jacques Plant mask that was complete. It only covered your face; it didn't cover your your ears or anything. So. Uh, I thought it wasn't safe and I got hit a couple of times and I got cut. And so I, I thought I need a, I need a real mask. So, uh, a friend of mine who was a, a goalie, Ken Kinney, uh, he was a junior goalie and he told me about this guy, uh, Vic Lemire who made masks. And so, uh, I made an appointment, paid the $155 to, to get it made and, and showed up. And, and so he put me on a table uh, laying flat on my back and then he put uh, water on my face and then saran wrap and then this mold like the plaster of Paris so he made a mold of my face and then yeah I had two straws sticking out of my nose so that I could breathe and I don't breathe really well through my nose so this was like 20 minutes of torture for me so so yeah and then uh, a couple weeks later, he, he had the mask ready, and uh, I've, I've got it hanging on my wall. You can't see it, but uh, I still have it, and it, uh, it served me long and well, and I only got cut once when I was wearing it. I got a little a slap shot right in the eye, and, uh, and it cut me just a little bit, and that was the only time. And in 35 years of hockey, I never had a concussion, so uh, my, I either have a really hard head or a really small brain. So <laughs> <laughs> You did have one shot, though, that rendered you without hearing for mm. a little while. So good thing you had that mask, but why were the leagues you're playing in even allowing slap shots? I mean, most of the guys didn't know where those shots were headed. Well, when I started, uh, old timers hockey, I don't think was a thing, you know, where they eliminated the slap shots and, uh, I always hated that rule anyway, the no slap shot rule. I think it's like playing baseball and saying you're only allowed to bunt, you know, <laughs> it, it, it takes an element out of the game that, that I, I thoroughly enjoyed. I always, uh, loved the challenge of stopping a guy's slap shot. And so, yeah, just in that one where I lost my hearing, the, it was a guy who wasn't even very good. And, uh, he came to the face off dot and let one go and i was expecting you know end over end and <laughs> he just let a rocket go hit me square right in the forehead and went straight up and hit the roof of the <laughs> hit the roof of the rink and i and i <laughs> and i and I, and I i was deaf for the next few minutes and the the ringing in my ears didn't go away for probably a day 
explain this phrase from the book. There's a brawl on blue. There's a <laughs> brawl on blue. Yeah. Well, that was Wade Hawksworth. He was, uh, he was a, guy, a good hockey player. Uh, really, really nice guy off the ice, <laughs> but he, uh, he had a hair trigger on the ice. So he, we played this team called the smokers and, and they had a goalie who liked to leave the net and play the puck. And he was really good at it. He was really smooth. And, uh, and, uh, the guy got the puck and, and was moving out and Wade went in to check him. And the guy did a, <laughs> a juke, you know, and then got around Wade and Wade ended up tripping and falling down and falling into the end boards. And the guy made his pass and then he was skating backwards <laughs> to the net. And then Wade lost that hair trigger temper <laughs> and came back and just cross checked the guy in the back and, and landed on him and then start, started, started, windmilling him <laughs> and, and and of course both benches clear and uh and so that was my very first uh, uh bench clearing brawl uh, one of two that i was involved in and and so uh, the whole mess is going on and usually in a bench clearing brawl the goalies go at each other and neither team had a backup goalie so uh my partner in this melee was pinned down <laughs> getting windmilled by wade and i I, so I ended up just staying in my net and watching the whole thing. And, uh, there was like 300 people <laughs> watching and the, the, the bar was up above the rink. So everybody's, uh, noses are pinned to the glass watching. And then a guy had run down cause there was four rinks and a guy had run down the concourse yelling, there's a brawl on blue. There's a brawl. <laughs> so everybody came running. <laughs> and so like the, 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 it was the biggest crowd up to that point that I had ever played in front of. <laughs> so it was. <laughs> <laughs> How much of a surprise was it when the recreational league you were playing in named you MVP? Oh, yeah. Um to say I was shocked was uh you know, was <laughs> I wasn't expecting it. It was it was uh you know, I I knew I'd had a good year and my my team had done well. We had finished second, you know, we went to the finals. Uh, lost, but we, you know, and I, I done, done that. That was my second year playing. So I'd gotten to the point where I was getting better. I thought I was getting better. Anyway, my skating was improving and, and I was making some saves and you got to remember like having not played ice hockey goalie for, for 18 years, you know, when growing up, I never got any coaching. I never, I didn't, you know, just basically what I knew from street hockey. So you know, I, I had no clue what I was doing. I was always falling backwards and, and, you know, I was all reflex and no technique. So this is my second year playing hockey. I won the MVP in this, uh, North Vancouver recreational league. And that, uh, yeah, and it was a huge trophy and, and just like, man, I couldn't, I, I couldn't have been more surprised, but it was a, a great, I wish I still had the trophy, but it got lost somewhere along my many moves. It is impossible to overlook the way you have written your name, Jerry Teabag Hack. It's the way your name appears on the cover of the book. Please explain. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, just recently, uh, a, a friend in New York uh, knew knew a manager of a rock star that I was a fan of growing up. And, and so he asked the manager to get me an autographed copy of his book, but the guy was so offended by my nickname that he, he refused. And I said, it has nothing to do with that. It's not X rated. And so, but he didn't care. So anyway, it's not X rated. It's totally cool. <laughs> it just, uh, but I had the nickname long before that term became a, you know, a, you know, something that's not quite so savory, but so I refused to give it up when I was, when my first year playing, uh, and like I said, I had no clue what I was doing. So, um, I had some, <laughs> I had a few rough games. And so I, I had a bad game. I, I let in probably four, five, 12 goals. And so, um, I, I got back into the dressing room and, and everybody's talking, you know, everybody, it's pretty loud. Everybody's talking and, and this player, Kelly Gladson, who was a really good player. He played junior and, and he, I was taking off my stuff and he's just staring at me like 
glaring, <laughs> like trying to drill a hole in me <laughs> with, with his with his eyes, and uh, and so I'm taking out my stuff, and I said, "Kelly, what's up?" And he goes, "You're a tea bag," and I and everybody stopped talking, so it got quiet in the room, and and tea bag. Nobody understood the reference he was making. So so anyway, tea bag. What are you talking about? And he goes, everything goes through you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, and so, and so uh, everybody erupted in laughter. Oh, T-Bag, T-Bag, what a great nickname, you're T-Bag. And then, and then I didn't like the nickname. I really didn't want it. And uh, I was hoping for a, a cool nickname like Brick Wall or something like, you know, something like that. And uh, uh, there was one another guy on the team who just absolutely loved that nickname. So every time I walked into the bar or crowded party or crowded room or something, he'd yell across the room, "Tea bag!" And everybody, you know, invariably would say, "Tea bag, white tea bag," because everything goes through him. Ah, tea bag, what a great nickname! So I couldn't escape it, and uh, eventually I just had to accept it. And now it's. It's some people don't even know my real name. They just know me as T-Bag. For the rest of this interview, I'm going to refer to you as Earl Gray. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Earl. Uh, tell me about your brief encounter with longtime NHLer Cliff Ronning. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. Well, Cliff is from the same town, Burnaby, that I'm from, and so uh the rink that we played at had casual hockey you know you could go pay your five bucks and and play for basically as long as you wanted and cliff ronning would show up and and play you know it's just casual hockey and and so the the first time that i i met him you know i'm thinking you know and at this time i'm getting pretty good i'm thinking you know i'm pretty cocky i'm <laughs> i like you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty modest guy, but but in my own head, I, I'm really cocky. <laughs> I have this crushing confidence in myself, and I don't know where it comes from. I, it just is, and so I accept it. But anyway, uh, so at this point, I, I'm thinking that I'm an NHL-caliber goalie who's just stuck playing beer league hockey. So I'm thinking, okay, Cliff, you know, show me what you got, and <laughs> I'm going to make you look dumb, and then... And the opposite turned out to be true. He just made me, he made me look stupid. Like it just, uh, and he scored on me pretty much every time he, he tried. And like, I don't think I stopped him once. Maybe in warm up, I stopped him once. But uh, yeah, he just then, and he, there was this one particular play where, where he came in and I kind of forced him to go off to the side and I thought, okay, I got you now. And then, and then he made this stupid little backhand pass to somebody standing wide open in front and the guy scored. And I just thought, oh my God, <laughs> I'm horrible. I'm horrible. <laughs> For a chance to catch on with another team, you write that you once took a 31 hour car ride. And what, one of the things that struck me about your journey no pun intended is that the amount of time you spend on buses and in cars traveling i mean i don't think there's a better indication of the dedication that you guys had to actually play the games yes well it's uh let me say that one one year I decided to drive out to Saskatchewan and, and yeah, it took me 30, 30 hours with no radio. <laughs> so I didn't have a tape deck or anything. I, I had no music to listen to. Just that's a long time to be inside of your own head. So it was, it was a very sobering experience, but, uh, yeah, the, the bus trips actually were my favorite part. Um, we drove on this 1962 Greyhound. We called the iron lung and, and, uh, you know, it, we spent a lot of time on that bus traveling all over Saskatchewan, but that was my favorite part because after the games were over, you know, uh, when we'd be leaving town, we'd stop at the bar and pick up, you know, beer and stuff to eat and, and whatnot. And so, you know, and on the way back guys would be playing cards and then they'd just be telling these stories. Cause like I say, pretty much everybody played junior, a few played pro and even a couple made it, you know, and had a cup of coffee in the NHL. So, 
they all had these incredible, funny stories to tell. And I, I would just sit back and listen. I wish I could remember some of them, but, uh, you know, well, most of them were pretty X rated, so I probably couldn't say them anyway, but, uh, but man, it was hilarious. Like we just, uh, that was my absolute favorite part. And I, you know, that's the thing I, I enjoy about, uh, uh, reading these these hockey books is guys have great stories to tell and they're hilarious and so yeah that was my absolute favorite part but yeah we spent a lot of time on that bus one of the funny stories you told was about putting on a pair of skates that were ice cold <laughs> yeah <laughs> well um yeah like i didn't know <laughs> you know, I wasn't, I didn't know the, the lower part of the bus wasn't heated and everybody else brought their skates onto the bus with them. I, I didn't even notice, I, you know, I'm dumb and that way, you know, just ignorant because yeah, I had no clue. So yeah, it was like minus 30 out and we're traveling two and a half hours from the town I was in to, uh, just outside Regina. And so, um, yeah, when I got, got my skates on, it's like minus a thousand degrees Kelvin. <laughs> just, you know, I, I put them on my feet and almost got instant frostbite. And I, I had to go grab a, uh, a blow dryer and, uh, try, try to heat up my skates. And then, and, uh, that game I didn't play. I play, I sat on the bench and by the end, man, I was, I was a, I was a block of ice, <laughs> including my feet. <laughs> a teammate of yours, Chili shared a story with you about a game he played in junior that involved Grant Fuhr. Yeah. Um, Mark Davis uh, played in Brandon, for the Brandon Wheat Kings, and uh, as a 17-year-old, and, and he was telling us the story. Like, he, he didn't get to play very much. He, he sat on the bench and got the odd spot shift here and there it was never a guarantee that he was even going to get in the game and so you know he he's sitting there and I, they're on this western road strike and brandon it is in the western hockey league is the worst one because you got to go from brandon all the way to portland and then work your way back and so it's just a long long bus ride and he so he told me this story that they're playing in victoria and and he He's sitting there like normal. They're losing. And so he's sitting there like normal. And then suddenly he gets the tap on the shoulder and he thinks, okay, here's my chance. I'm going to show something. I'm, I'm going to make something happen out there. And so, so he gets on the ice and he makes a beeline for the goalie and he just, and he just goes boom and just runs the goalie and knocks him right out of the net. And, and, uh, and it's Grant Fuhrer. <laughs> future Hall of Famer Grant Fuhr. And so uh, he said Tory Robertson picked him up off the ice and, and just started laying into him. And and so Chili lost the, the two front teeth that he had. He wore a bridge. And he, so he'd pull out the bridge to show us the proof that his story was true. <laughs> <laughs> the second and thankfully final time that you were involved in a bench clearing brawl, you described it as pandemonium. Oh. Yeah, it was, uh, it was funny. Um, excuse me. Um, we played, that was my first year in Saskatchewan <clears throat> and the Moose Jaw Generals were a perennial powerhouse you know, in that league. And they were, uh, every year they would go to the Canadian championships and, and play for the Hardy cup. And they actually won the Hardy cup, I think a year or two before I got there. And so they're, they were just a powerhouse team and they were not only beat you on the scoreboard, they would beat you in the back alley too. Like you know, once they got up on you, they'd start, they'd start the shenanigans and, and whatnot. So, uh, at the end of the last game that I played against them, uh, we were up, uh, 10 to nine and, uh, believe it or not, senior hockey, <laughs> 10 to nine wasn't an uncommon score. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, the final buzzer goes and all of a sudden they just start, they all drop the gloves and they just start, they didn't like losing. So they, you know, they, they came at us, but the only problem was they only had eight guys. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they came down with eight players and then, 
started a bench clearing brawl. So confidence was not their problem. They, <laughs> and then they had a suspended player in the crowd and he came running down and, and goes to our bench and, and attacks our coach. And our coach actually did pretty well. <laughs> our coach was an old time player too. So, uh, yeah. And, and this player, uh, I won't mention his name, but I mentioned it in the book. Uh, he's, there's a water pipe that goes above our bench, right above the boards. And so he's hanging onto the, onto the, <laughs> the water pipe and he's trying to kick people. He's just <laughs> he's trying to kick everybody. And so he actually got suspended for life for that incident. And, uh, he ended up coming back uh, two or three years later, but he had to put up a bond uh, that he wouldn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was it was crazy times back then. Senior hockey was you know it was the wild west and wasn't uncommon for goalies to get run. I got run multiple times. A fellow netminder introduced you to what he called the ten second rule. What is the ten second rule? Um. That was Mike Belosky. Uh, he was a goalie for uh, Saskatoon Blades, uh, and he was kind of like the hired gun around uh, Saskatchewan. Like when teams needed a, a really good goalie to go somewhere, some tournament, or you know, they'd all try to get Mike. You know, because he was uh, ex pro. He had <clears throat> he'd been in Philadelphia for a little while and played for Hershey. And uh, yeah, so he was an awesome, awesome goalie, and and so uh, I'd be picking his brain all the time. I'm sure I annoyed the hell out of him because I was constantly picking his brain because that's how I learned, right? By watching other people and asking questions and and whatnot. I was still a young guy at this point, and I'm still trying to find my way. And and so Mike, having played pro, he was like. <laughs> well, this guy's got to be an encyclopedia and he had this way of playing that really mystified me because he'd force guys to shoot right at him and uh it was a, it was the craziest thing i thought you know like he, he had this timing thing down and 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 even when he had to react he had those reflexes that he made some acrobatic saves that just defied the laws of physics and so you know he was just a great great goalie and and so I'd be picking his brain all the time. And he told me about, you know, um, cause I had played, he was on the bench. I was playing and, and, and I, I let in a goal and then a really bad goal. And it really got to me. I was rattled and I, you know, I, <laughs> you know, so I ended up letting in a couple more and, and so just from my lack of mental toughness. And so he pulled me aside and he said, okay, here's a, Lesson number one, this is the most important lesson you'll ever learn being a goalie at a, at a high level. He said, the 10 second rule, you, you have 10 seconds to be mad at yourself. Then you have to forget it. You have to let it be like water off a duck's back. You cannot, you cannot dwell on it. You can't, you just got to let it go. Cause the, the most important save you're ever going to make is the next one. So he said, you can't let it snowball into into something worse that's going to cost your team you've got to be mentally tough and 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 forget about it so he said the best the the best thing a goalie can have is a short memory so so that always stuck with me and i i i live by that i still live by that rule <laughs> you mentioned mike's acrobatic saves you once is this right made a dominic hashik save <laughs> Yeah, it was in a championship game. It was uh it's funny. Um the player that came in on me, he was on the semi break, his name was Jerry Bick. So it was like almost Jerry Hag. It was like <laughs> we're almost like two two sides of the same coin anyway. So anyway, he this Jerry Bick guy came in on a on a semi breakaway, he had a, a clear path to the net from from my right. And so he uh he looked like he was going to shoot and I'm thinking glove side all the way. Like I am hook, line and sinker. <laughs> I'm positive. He's going to go glove side and he faked it and, and then went to, went to his backhand and then 
and he had me oh he had me so bad <laughs> like he had probably half the net to shoot at and so so i laid down on my back and flipped my legs up <laughs> so like dominic hashik used to do and this was before hashik was around so you know nobody had ever seen that before and so they got him uh jerry bick actually backhanded the puck right up into my my legs and uh yeah and the crowd went wild and it was like it was one of the most mind-blowing saves anybody had seen up to that point so yeah it was just but it just came from desperation it just was nothing more than that so actually dominic hashik was doing a jerry hack so i'm glad we set the well i, I only straight. did it the one time so <laughs> you know he he perfected it so you know he did it multiple multiple times so yeah i i wouldn't I wouldn't think that uh, Dominic Hashik would want to copy me. <laughs> what was it like playing against the Russians? Oh, that was in Whitehorse. Uh, yeah, it was amazing. Um, that was right when, that was 1991, uh, and the Russian uh, Red Army 2nd Division team came. So they were all pro professional players. They were doing a tour. They went to... Uh, Anchorage, then Fairbanks, then they came to Whitehorse, all three game series, and they hadn't lost a game. They had tied one, I think, against Anchorage. And so so they come to uh, Whitehorse, and our team wasn't as strong as uh, Fairbanks and Anchorage. They had really, really strong teams. So, you know, they they come in, and, and uh, it was like nothing I had ever seen before. They were, they were like robots. They, were, they, they played with no emotion. They just, uh, even when they scored a goal, they, they would only kind of congregate a little bit and then tap each other on the shin pads and then go back and, and wait for the face off again. There was no joy in their game. There was, you know, so it was, it was really, really strange. And, uh, but I got to tell you that <laughs> they, they left with, um, I don't want to say they left, but when they left town, there was a lot of injured players. <laughs> It's like a lot of guys on the injured list is like I say, we weren't as talented, but we played them hard and, uh, and they, they got, they got quite a few injuries during that series. Let's end with this. You mentioned Anchorage and Fairbanks. And I, I know that you got to play in Alaska as well. Believe it or not, as far North as, white horses i mean it's above where british columbia ends fairbanks is even further north but you wrote the intensity of the fans in alaska was second to none off the charts oh it was crazy they uh they played in this uh 2000 seat arena called uh, the big dipper and they filled it and uh yeah it was it was a lot of fun playing there because it was just a, an electric uh, atmosphere. And I, I found that I, I tended to play really well there. So they hated me. <laughs> just like, so, you know, they, they'd call me names, like names I'd never heard of before. And, uh, and I had this uh, habit of skating from side to side between, between whistles. And, and so uh, when I, <laughs> they'd be banging on the glass and, and swearing at me and, and one kid even put up a, 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 a magazine behind the magazine. He flipped me the bird. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty funny. And, uh, yeah, they were, they were intense, uh, raucous and rude. <laughs> like they, 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 you know, they, they were what hockey fans should be. You know, I, I always enjoyed playing there. I even tried to play there after, my after Whitehorse, I, I phoned the guy who ran the team and and said, if, you know, are you looking for a goalie? And he just said, well, our policy is that you actually have to be in town and then try out for the team. And then so I, I couldn't do that. I'm mean, going Canadian going to the States is a pretty long process. So one more thing about the Alaskan fans, you played a two game set there. And when it was over, you experienced what you called the proudest moment of my hockey career. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it was, uh, 
Dennis Salamandic was the other goalie. He played for Medicine Hat. He was a he was a great goalie and and a really good guy. But uh, the he couldn't come on this one trip because of of work commitment. So I ended up being the only goalie. Well, we brought on a midget goalie with us, but he wasn't going to play. He was just there in case I got killed. <laughs> so so yeah. So and uh, I ended up uh, stopping more than fifty shots in both games and and was probably the best two game stretch that I had at my career in Whitehorse. And, uh, so I stopped 104 out of 112 shots. We lost both games, but, but I played well. And, uh, so after the game and then the handshake, uh, the, the announcer comes on and says, Jerry Hack has stopped 104 out of 112 shots. How about we give him a rousing motivation? And, and all 2000 people stood up. <laughs> and were and applauded me for like over a minute and uh and i i couldn't believe it i just like because they sure were no fan of me <laughs> it was like you know it wasn't our crowd and it wasn't you know and they didn't uh you know they didn't like me very much and so uh, i just took that as uh you know i must have done something pretty special to get that kind of reaction and so uh, yeah probably the proudest moment of my my hockey career for sure. Something pretty special is Memoirs of a Hockey Nobody, Jerry Hack. Where, Jerry, can people find this book? Besides <laughs> in your hands. <laughs> yeah, um, it's in a couple of bookstores here in Vancouver, uh, one in Langley and one in Mission, where I live. And other than that, you can get it on Amazon, uh, both Canada and U.S. and uh, Indigo Chapters, uh, Barnes and Noble, Smashwords, uh, yeah. So basically, any online bookstore you can find it. And uh, yeah, it's been. Speaking of my proudest moment, uh, you know, when I wrote the book, I I had no expectations of it doing anything. I I really thought it would just be family and friends who who read it. I mean, I was just goofing around on Facebook telling stories of my hockey playing days and people kept saying you should write a book you should write a book so so i sat down and wrote the first couple of chapters and showed it to my wife and she you know it's hard to get my wife to laugh out loud and she started laughing and then and then there's a uh kind of a heartbreaking tale of my youth and and she started to cry so i thought, <laughs> I thought okay well maybe we got something here so yeah it's uh it, it's far exceeded my expectation and and yeah I, I i couldn't be prouder of it and and i get to do shows like this with you and and yeah it's been uh been very special so yeah that's a that's a very proud moment for me a real hockey somebody jerry hack thank you so much for your time jerry enjoyed the stories very much and believe me, we just scratched the surface of what's in the book. So thanks for your time. Oh, thank you, uh, Glenn. I'm, I'm, this, this is something I can cross off my bucket list now because I'm a huge fan of the show and I, I, I watch it uh, faithfully. So, so I was so glad to meet you and uh, hopefully we can do it in real life one day. Very good. Well, Mr. Earl Gray, everybody. <laughs> oh, and if I could just mention one other thing, I've started yeah. my own podcast it's called hockey books and storytellers it's actually hockey comma books and storytellers so we don't pigeon ourselves to hockey but we're we're hockey centric but uh my friend uh craig reedy and i started this uh podcast and and so uh hopefully everybody would uh check it out and subscribe and like the videos and uh, lots of good stories on the on the channel so thanks glenn you bet yeah i know you didn't get that fancy microphone and headphones just for me Oh, no, I just did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs>